Hey, this is Mike, and this is the TYT MD380 UHF handheld, and we're going to take it apart and hopefully not break it. M17 is a project working on developing an open source digital radio protocol for data and voice called M17. There are several digital radio protocols like Yesu's C4FM, DMR, DSTAR, P25, but I'm pretty excited about M17 because it's the first open source digital radio protocol that is gaining some serious traction and seems to have really good community support. So what does M17 have to do with this radio? Well, this is an MD380 and it's a low cost DMR handheld that thanks to the open RTX project has open source firmware for it. And this open source firmware supports the new M17 protocol. Now, don't get me wrong, there's still a ways to go, but it's looking very promising and I wanna play around with it. Unfortunately, to use the OpenRTX firmware in the M17 digital mode, the radio needs a couple small modifications. And that's what this video is about. So I will put links into the description to both the projects and the radio modification instructions, but let's jump into this. So this is the TYT MD380. It's a nice little DMR radio, but we're gonna take it apart. You will need a few tools. You will need a Torx T6 and T8 screwdriver, a number one Phillips screwdriver, and a spludger. I have a few I've collected over the years and I'm sure one will work. Some other tools you'll need are a soldering iron with a fine tip and some solder. You'll need something to assist in desoldering, like a proper desoldering tool or some solder wick. Tweezers and a small long nose plier will also be useful. As for parts, you'll only need two, some 30 gauge Kynar wire and one 50K ohm surface mount resistor. As long as the value is close, it'll work. I'm using a 47 ohm resistor because that's what I had. So first we'll need to remove the antenna and the battery. Then we'll pull off the knobs. The volume knob was a little stubborn, so I got a spludger and that immediately nudged it enough for me to remove it by hand. Next, we'll need to remove the three nuts that are around the two knobs and the antenna. Uh, I used the end of a small long nose plier to rotate the ridges in the nut, but uh, don't squeeze the plier as you don't want to put pressure on the shafts. Once it's loose, you can use a, something small and pointy to quickly unscrew it the rest of the way. We will go around to the back and use our T8 driver to remove the top two screws that hold on the black cover. Then remove the two lower screws. I couldn't get the lower screws out all the way, so I used a strong magnet to grab them. The next step is to separate the heatsink from the case. But be careful as there are wires that need to be disconnected before pulling it fully apart. Failure to do so can damage the radio. So once all four screws are out, the instructions say to use a spludger to remove the metal chassis, but I didn't get very far with it. So instead, I used the T8 Torx screwdriver, and I put it into one of the lower holes in the heatsink, just deep enough to get through the metal, and kind of angled it so it grabbed and gently pulled on it. There's a rubber gasket around the heatsink, so just take your time. Again, be very careful you don't pull hard and have it pop out, taking out the ribbon cable that is hidden below. Uh, don't say I didn't warn you. Once you have the heat sink separated, gently slide it down to release the knob shafts and the antenna connector from the case. Uh, now you can access the ribbon cable. The ribbon cable is connected to a connector that is two-tone. There is a darker part that moves and the white part is soldered to the board. Take a small tool and gently push each side of the dark part of the connector away from the white part 
towards the ribbon cable. It only moves about two millimeters, but when both sides are released, the ribbon cable should basically fall out of the connector. Now that the ribbon cable is released, you can pull the speaker connector out to fully separate the case and the heat sink. Next, we need to remove the 11 Phillips screws. The instructions say that they are number zero Phillips, but I did not like how it fit. The number one Phillips fit much better. It could very well be that they use different screws during manufacturing, so your mileage may vary. Because at this point, I don't know if the screws are different sizes, I am taking them out and placing them in the same pattern as they are in the board. Once I got them all out, I can see that they're all the same size, so I mixed them together. The only different one was the one with the spring tab on it, which is the second one up from the bottom right. Next, we remove the two T6 Torx screws holding in the side buttons. At this point, even though I didn't do it, I recommend gently removing the gasket. It gets in the way later. In order to remove the board from the heatsink, we need to desolder the antenna connector. I can't say enough about having the proper desoldering tool. For those that don't have one, you'll have to use solder wick or solder pump. Once the solder is out, I check to make sure that the pin is truly disconnected from the via in the board. Make sure not to disturb the nearby surface mount parts. We are almost ready to remove the board, but the side button board actually has two locating pins that you need to clear before the board will come out. I try to gently use the spludger to pry the board just enough to clear the pins, but it doesn't really work. I resort to using my tweezers to lift the board and the spludger to keep the board from falling back down on the pins. Again, be very careful. You don't want to rip the solder pads off the board. Now that the board has cleared the pins, we can gently work the board out of the heatsink. This is where having removed the gasket before trying to remove the board would have made it easier as it was getting hung up on the gasket at the top. Okay, so we have the board out. Hopefully you haven't broken anything yet. Now let's uh, get on to the modifications. The first mod we need to do is remove a few parts from this area. This large yellow capacitor, EC151, this diode, D102, and this tiny cap, C115. So normally I would use my stereo microscope for this, but instead I'm using it for the video. So this was definitely a lot harder to do uh, looking at a monitor instead of through the stereo microscope. Also, I don't know what's up with this tip. This definitely wasn't my best work, but I got it done. Once the larger cap was off, I removed the small cap. Adding a blob of solder makes it easy to heat both ends and knock the part off. Just be careful not to touch the adjacent parts. And finally, we need to remove this diode. Again, judicial use of solder helps, which I seem to fail to do. I use the tweezer to gently apply pressure as I heat it, but not prying, otherwise you could lift the pads off the board. This tip is brand new and it's terrible, but we'll get it off. Now that we have all three parts off, I'd like to clean up the area a bit. First, I use the desoldering iron to remove any excess solder from the pads. Make sure you don't suck up any SMT parts. I actually did that once trying to repair a mobile radio. Yeah, don't do that. Now I use some flux cleaner and a small brush to clean up the flux. After I scrub it a bit, I use the brush on top of a paper towel which soaks up the remaining flux cleaner and leaves things nice and clean. So now we need to connect the resistor. I use these SMT resistors I had lying around. We need to connect one side of the resistor to the top pad of the EC151 capacitor we removed. But we need to be careful about what is under the other side of the resistor. Uh, even though there's some solder mask on the vias, I don't want to take a chance of it shorting to the board. 
So while a little captain tape is the best option here, I don't have any, so some electrical tape will have to do. I cut a small piece of the tape and placed it under where the resistor will go. Once the tape is in place, we move the resistor into position and solder it to the pad. I move the board around a little bit just to get a better angle with the iron. Now we need to wire the other side of the resistor. The way I like to handle placing wires like this is I take the Kynar wire and I strip off one to one and a half inches off the, uh, of insulation off the end of the wire. I usually bend the wire uh, to make sure that it doesn't bend where I strip the wire. Uh, if it does, I likely nick the wire and I cut, cut it off and start over. So now that I have the stripped wire, I place the end of the insulation where it needs to go on the board, and then I pick a point where the insulation should end. So I route the wire and determine where I need to cut the insulation. And once I know where, then I carefully strip the insulation starting at that location and slide it to the end of the wire. I don't actually remove it from the wire. So I slide it, leaving only the amount of wire I need to solder to the part exposed. This gives me a long wire to use as a uh, handle of sorts to help you manipulate it into position um, instead of having to try to control a tiny little wire. Of course, sometimes you go too far with the insulation and it comes off the end of the wire and you have to start again. So one end of the wire will go to these two caps. I put a solder blob on it to make it easier to solder. You can see I moved the insulation to expose only as much wire as I needed to solder, but you can actually do this after you solder the wire. Uh, even after I solder the wire, I actually do slide it down uh, once I'm done to get the wire covered as much as possible with the insulation. I use a tweezer to route the wire and it's a little shorter than I wanted, but we can make it work. See how I have the long end of the wire still attached so I can easily place the wire where I need it and solder it to the resistor. And oops, I actually soldered the solder to the wire too. But I can snip the spool of wire off and we're done. Next, we need to move down towards the bottom of the board and this resistor needs to be removed. Again, I'll use the solder blob method to quickly remove the tiny resistor and clean it up real quick with the desoldering iron. We need to connect a wire from the left pad of the resistor to the top left pin of the adjacent chip. Again, I use the same technique with the wire. I measure the length of the insulation I need to make the connection. I use tweezers to manipulate the wire into the path I want. And once I know the length, I strip that amount, but leave it on the wire. Then I tin the resistor pad and solder the end of the wire to it. Slide the insulation to the solder joint for maximum coverage. Again, I use the tweezers to route the wire and align it with the pin on the chip. I bend the wire so I can use the long end to place the wire exactly where I need it. A quick dab of solder on the chip and I can then solder the wire to it. Clip the end and inspect for shorts. This is looking pretty good. We have one last mod left and that is on the RF side of the board. So we need to flip the board over and remove this tiny capacitor. 
This is a little tough just because it's in between a few other parts. So just be careful not to desolder the adjacent parts. Again, using the solder blob method, the part comes off easily. A fine soldering iron tip is especially useful here. Inspect it to make sure there are no solder bridges and we are done modding. So it's time to put it back together. Assembly is simply reverse of disassembly. I took the camera off the microscope so I can actually look through it uh, for final inspection. Everything looks good, so back together it goes. Place the board back in the heatsink, taking note that the pin for the antenna needs to make it through the hole so it can be resoldered. Um, I had a little trouble and found it to be the battery connection on the back uh, of the assembly needs to be pretty straight for the board to kind of sink into that gasket. You'll also have to carefully pry the side button board around uh, the pins in the heatsink. Take your time, don't force it, and uh, make sure that the pin for the antenna is coming through that hole before you fully seat it. Once it's fully seated, you can install the two screws for the side button board. And go ahead and install the 11 screws in the back of the board. Remember which screw the spring contact goes. You can always look at the case to see uh, where the spring contact is supposed to touch the front display board. Uh, when installing the new screws, uh, be sure not to cross thread them. It's uh, pretty easy to do. I leave all the screws loose until I get them all in and then go ahead and tighten them all up. Next, we need to solder the antenna connection again. Pretty easy, easy to get to. A uh, quick inspection under the microscope and we are looking good. Uh, at this point, I installed the gasket around the heatsink. Uh, it took me a bit to figure out the right way to put it on, but when you get it, it kind of just falls into place. I used my tweezer to kind of slide it onto the shafts uh, on the top of the radio. The bottom of the gasket is a little floppy. It just kind of sits there. It's kind of weird. Now the hard part, putting the assembly back in the case. This would be a lot easier if I wasn't also trying to get a good angle for the camera, but first connect the speaker connection. Then place the control shafts through the holes in the case. Next, we have to get that ribbon cable back in. So uh, gently insert it into the connector on the board. Make sure the brown clip on the connector is still pulled out. Uh, I'm using a tweezer here to hold the ribbon cable, but I can't say uh, that's recommended. I'm being very gentle with it, but the pointy tip could uh, easily damage it. The idea is that you want to get the ribbon cable fully inserted into the connector and then lock it in by pushing the brown lock back into position. Once locked, the amount of blue showing should be minimal and it should be uniform across the whole connector uh, indicating that the connectors in, the ribbon cable is all the way in and straight. Uh, once the ribbon cable is locked in, Gently slide the heat sink into the case, uh, taking note that the gasket is in position. Before putting all the screws back in, I decided to throw the battery in there and check, and sure enough, it still boots. So at this point, we just need to reinstall the three nuts uh, back on the top and tighten them down with a long nose plier. We need to reinstall the bottom screws into the heatsink, uh, reinstall the top screws into the cover. Uh, we put the knobs back on, uh, making sure you match the flat spot on the shaft with the flat spot on the knob. And we are done. This radio is now ready to have the OpenRTX firmware installed.
I hope this was helpful. And if you like this content, please be sure to like and subscribe. Have a good one and we'll see you on the next one.